Hello, this is Real History, and today is September the 21st, 2023, and I am joined today by Peter from British Columbia, Canada. Hi, Peter. Hello, how's it going? Light camera action. We were yeah. just talking on the phone, and uh, suddenly with that tone of voice. Uh, Did I get a, a radio voice all of a sudden? <laughs> yeah, jeez. You gave me straight fright. We have dead air there. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. gonna start again? No, no, no. So oh, no starting again. I no, no good. starting over. No do overs. We're gonna pretend we're live. Well, I wanted okay. to just right off the bat get you to share with us uh, a little bit about yourself, what you're comfortable sharing. I'm curious. I know that I've been emailing back and forth with you for a long, long time, a long time on behalf of Alan, but it, it just seems like years I've been knowing you and following the ups and downs of your life. And if you want to share a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. Well, I always knew something was going on something was weird but it was like back in the 90s there was no internet so I just moved to Montreal and then like university from a really small town and university radio was wow like who Noam Chomsky wow he's really telling the truth of course we know what a dick that guy is now what a piece of crap he is now but so I've had a long history of heroes that just turned out to be you know controlled working for the man. But that's how you got to learn. That's how I've learned. I've, I'm an idiot. I made so many mistakes in life, but then if you learn from them, eventually wisen up. Well, that's the important uh, thing about mistakes. If you, you truly are an idiot, if you can't learn from your mistakes, and that's all, <laughs> that's the best that we can hope for is that we learn from our mistakes. Yeah, so it was, and Alan, the first time I heard him, I saw something, I was just searching through the computer, that was back in the days, like 2006, 2007, when they were sucking everybody in, you could get free movies, anything you wanted for free, and I was just searching, and then I saw Alan Watt uh, talking about chemtrails, and I thought it was Alan Watts, um, you know, the, the, the guy mm -hmm. that uh, explains religions and how they work. Uh, I think he died in 1971 or the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what's he talking about chemtrails? This is crazy. But I downloaded it, and that's the first time I heard Alan, and just thought, whoa, yeah. When you're when you're looking for somebody to tell you the truth, when you're looking for a show, it's great. You get just like a magnet. You, whoa, what's Alan said? Who's this guy? So I started listening to him. Went through all the. That was back. Jackie Petru was on uh, YouTube. I remember so many times, like, woman, shut up and let him talk. And then he'd forget what he was saying. <laughs> um, but, yeah, now, now I've heard them all so much. I've had jobs where I work 12-hour shifts, just uh, oiler men and maintenance, just you're alone, and I would just listen to podcasts and listen to all the Allens, Allens talks, hours and hours of them. Like when you have reduxes now, I know most of them by heart. Mm -hmm. So that's how I know Allen. I uh, kind of my world view is completely affected by him, like in f everything. I see it through what he was explaining. Like in Canada, the judicial system is so corrupt. Like there's no charter of freedom and rights. That's just gone. And all the judges are corrupt. And everyone's saying it's corrupt. The system's corrupt. But if you see it like Alan explained it. Well, no, they're following orders from up above. Mm -hmm. And we have to get rid of rights and freedoms and people have to obey can just see all these guys right down the line taking orders from somewhere. Mm -hmm. We blame it on the WEF or, you know, the UN or China. Like the China's running the country, and they probably are. That's another thing Alan explained. They always move. They always have one central power where they rule from or they use for their own purposes. Like England passed a baton to America, and now we're passing it over to China. All the Canadian politicians knew this. Like, they're, they're sending their kids to Chinese universities. The UBC in Vancouver is full of Chinese writing. Like, it's mostly Chinese kids there. 
especially in the summer. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing Alan said that they were over here training because uh, Vancouver is a port city where all of the the goods from China are coming in. Now you could see how long ago this was planned when you look at Hong Kong when they signed that agreement to just rent Hong Kong. England was just going to rent it for 100 years, right when it was time for China to take over, and then take over the port city. And I don't know how I got over here talking about China. <laughs> oh yeah, we were talking about how. <laughs> That's okay. I'm I'm curious just to go back a little bit into your really young days. You said you always knew that things were wrong. I mean, what what were some of the things that you looked at when you were quite young before Alan, before, you know, when you were they gave us the internet, you're looking around. What was it that you were seeing that you thought, "Well, this is not right. I'm going to look for some answers." Subliminal messages in the sitcoms and sometimes I would just see them and just sort of trip out into a different frame of mind and see how controlled in the phrases that didn't make sense. I thought that, and then, then it occurred to me because I was reading, uh, Desmond Morris, uh, the naked ape and, uh, the human zoo. And he was, that, those are brilliant books written in, I think the sixties. And he was explaining assimilation and then, oh, we're assimilating to the television characters. Mm-hmm. Just like you assimilate with the kids at school and like the catchphrases and stuff that we would invent, we all start saying them. But now we're assimilating to the television characters. You know, that occurred to me in school. Alan has talked about those books, and I've never read them. Do you want to share just a little bit of a summary on what he goes into? Yeah, that was years ago. Well, you're talking about assimilation. I mean, just that concept there that you brought up that we are almost in a way being morphed into something else. It's a, it's an interesting idea to me. That would be assimilation like with your friends at work. You're going to start having the same jokes. Like you assimilate to the people you hang around with all the time. You become like them. Maybe through osmosis, you start picking up their habits ways they think, even if you don't want to. Uh, and then, so if you were writing the television characters, like the sitcoms back then, you can definitely steer. Well, yeah, like look at, go back to I Love Jeannie, and um, the father used to be like a smart guy, and then mm-hmm. slowly over time he was Homer Simpson. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, interesting. That is interesting, you know, that, the idea that they tell us about the entertainment industry is that it reflects culture, but it doesn't, of course. You know, if if you well, watch yeah, enough TV culture. and movies, it, it absolutely creates culture. I mean, I just think about the language that people use. Uh, I mentioned this in a Redux or something way back then. I mean, the first time that I heard, I think, damn, in a movie, I, it was just a, it was like a, Gong. It was the worst thing I'd ever heard because, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I'm sure that this is not common, especially not nowadays, but I grew up in a household where the swearing was not done under any circumstances <laughs> whatsoever. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Because I swear all the time. I'm sure I'm <laughs> oh, that's swearing. all right. I mean, I grew up, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> But what I'm yeah. saying, what I'm saying is that I actually think that the way that I grew up was fairly common at some point. Do you see what I'm saying? We assimilate yeah. to hear. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That that the more that we hear these things, especially it's, it's sort of like that example that Alan would use of the guy the broadcaster on say the bbc and he's interviewing oh you know some band you know let's just say it was the beatles or whatever and they're all fallen down stoned and the news anchor is is kind of making a joke like aren't we naughty ha ha you know i mean everybody knows they're stoned it's at a time when people don't even use the word stoned at least you know not on broadcast television but it's kind of uh, you know, getting the audience to assimilate with the idea that, look, these guys, they're rebels, they're musicians, they're, you know, they're breaking all the rules, and 
this BBC anchor is making it okay. He's giving it the stamp of approval because he's got him on there. It's in, you know, they're on national television. See what I mean? Well, yeah, totally. They, I remember when I was in high school, two girls got caught kissing or something. It was such a scandal that uh, one of the families moved out of town. Really? And then the last time I was there, the girls are gyrating on each other, humping each other on the dance floor in the local bar. And you could, because I remember back, those girls left, and then it was shortly after, or that family moved out of town, and it was shortly after, everyone's talking about, did you see what Madonna did? Like, what? What'd she do? She kissed a girl, or like... Then they slowly just brought the whole thing in until here we are now at LGBTQ mm -hmm. and the rest of it. Yeah, that's... So, yeah, of course, the, the whole culture steered through, mm -hmm. uh, through the media. It's a whole different show now with the interactive media and YouTube. And you're going to assimilate to the characters. Nobody watches sitcoms anymore, but they're going to assimilate to Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. They're going to assimilate to the guys they think that are cool. Mm-hmm. So who's controlled and who's not? It's a similar thing, too. With all of these things, there's an element of re rebellion, you know, that, that, that Alan thing, you know, that he would always say, oh, talking about my generation. So they put that out in the music, and the people who are listening to it, they think this is my generation, and we are the ones who are doing this. We're rebelling. We're rebels. So whatever it is, that the element, especially when it's something that has a cultural taboo on it, a strong cultural taboo. So lesbianism forever had a strong cultural taboo. And so the first time that that gets broken, it's naughty and it has an element of the thrill. It's titillating. It's exciting. It excites something in you know, primal that, you know, oh, look, a taboo got broken and people can't verbalize what it is, but they see it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. It is fun breaking taboos. When I was young, but like I said, I was an idiot. I remember I, I, I thought Sid Vicious was uh, like a, so cool. Like what kind of a nincompoop could I have been? I got a leather jacket like his would get drunk and stumble around it's hardest on the young kids when you're trying to find a, an identity and then it's all just right there. This is cool. This is in your parents' face. See, I think most people know that. They see it. Your listeners have, have grew up the same way, I bet you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder, I mean, I was uh, just doing a little exercise. I think I was at the Home Depot. This was last year. And so I thought I, I had been noticing that everyone, it seemed to me, everyone had a tattoo. And so I thought, well, let's just take a look. Let's just start looking as an exercise today here at Home Depot. And the first 10 people that I saw that I noted had a tattoo. You don't have to stare at them or, you know, you can just see it. They're walking by and, oh, yeah, there, there's the tattoo. And at a certain point, I did finally see somebody who's, if they had a tattoo, at least it wasn't visible. <laughs> it was covered up by clothing. But that, in other words, something that was at one point a sign of the rebel. You got the, the sailor in the Navy in World War II, and he gets the tattoo on his arm. It's the heart, and it says, Mom. And everybody looks at that guy. He comes back, and they're like, oh. And right then, it, there are all of the connotations of class, socioeconomics. Why would he do that? And then anybody who got a tattoo up until they started to popularize it about two decades ago, oh, well, they must have been drunk when they did that. you know. So it had all of these negative connotations and then of course that gave people who wanted to do it something to be rebelling against oh you know oh well i have a university degree and i am going to have something from the I Ching tattooed on me you know what i mean so it, it became um 
the thing to do. So it's no yeah, long well, it's I, no longer rebellion. It's the costuming or apparel that one has to have. Well, yeah, that's totally human nature. If, if you, in the lowest common denominator, to a small tribe in the bush, everybody has to wear the same clothes, wear the same loincloth, put the bone through their nose the same way. Mm-hmm. What I thought they were doing is protecting their way of life, because these people are surviving out in the wilderness. So their customs, the way that they make their bow and arrow, their fishing stuff, the way they do their dance before they go for a hunt. They don't want any of that to change, and everyone has to conform to those rules. Because if they deviate from them in some way, then their tribe could go extinct. Mm-hmm. That's well. That's yeah. You would. You just had that on a little while ago. Uh, Star suckers. I think they covered part of that in their cartoon form. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, that's... they copy. And I remember with the tattoos. I remember when they first came out. Like you could tell the age of the girl or, or the woman. I should say. Uh, by her tattoo because like early 90s they had a, an armband then there was then the, there was a butterfly or a tattoo just above their butt on their back on their lower back mm-hmm. and then it was like stars on their arms and for the past like 15 years it's been skulls like all these skulls and dead bodies like on a beautiful woman just right up her arm dead skulls mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's completely that's that's what our tribe does that's their identification I guess that the that it serves. You wonder the purpose of these things, like because if there's the I don't know the the African tribes that well, but there's the yeah, one tribe, either. you know, the one the where the women have a piece of pottery that's put in their ear. You know how it became a yep. fad. When was that that all the men were getting their ears pierced and yeah. then having that ring put inside of it, like a little platelet? Remember that? Yeah. And that was, what, about 20 years ago? Uh-huh. So that is the tribal identification that's it, given to their generation. Yeah, their, their generation. And if you look at the African tribes, see that, that the plate that got inserted into the lobe became bigger and bigger, and it, it's just, it, it's enormous. And then there's the other tribe. Remember that tribe where the women's necks are stretched out because of the ring, the, yeah. the necklace rings that they wear around them. And they actually can't take those off because it's, it has shaped the way their, I mean, their head wouldn't, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be able to hold their head up without well, those rings. Yeah, that's their tribal identification. Mm-hmm. Like that's why we have flags and national anthems and that's our tribe. So have you ever heard of a sibilis? It's something from the Bible, and uh, I don't know the exact story, but I guess they were at war, and I think it was the Jews, and the only way they could tell if there was infiltration was there was a word that they said that only they could say. Like, it was only in their accent. You had to grow up uh, saying this um, to say it right. It's like in French, it's really hard to roll the R's. That's their tribal identification. I can speak French, and I still have so much trouble rolling an R. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the same with when the French learn English, the TH is our sibilis, the. Mm-hmm. That's hard for a lot of other people. Uh, when English is their second language, they instead of father, they say fodder. Mm-hmm. Uh, or three is tree. Because mm-hmm. uh, that's our sibilis. So that's our identification. There's tons of, of uh, tribal identifications all throughout speech that evolve on their own. So like with the tattoos and stuff, you're identifying to my generation. This is my generation. There's my, my, you know, my flash right up front. This is who I am. There's a lot of strange, like the Quebecois. It's so hard to learn Quebecois because they they have a sibilis with uh, a, 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 their U is hard to say too. It's really hard to say, mm-hmm. and so they have eliminated every vowel in their language and replaced it with a U. So, for example, in France, for uh, uh, what's happening, you say « qu'est-ce qui se passe ?». But, uh, so, it, the Quebecois have removed the « a » in « spasse » and they put a « u » there. So, they say « qu'est-ce qui se passe ?»« Qu'est-ce qui se passe ?» Like, mm-hmm. I don't even know if I'm saying it, but the, it's really difficult. Like, they have, they've turned the entire language into a syllabus. It's a tribal identification. Maybe just because they were a small pocket of French surrounded by English. But that's the uh, 
That's the biggest example I can see in Quebec. And the word something in every accent and language, like in England, for the word something, uh, the northerners say summit. And, yes, and, yeah. And down in the south, they say something. Yes. I don't know what it is about this word something. And even in French, like the Quebec, the proper word or what the people in France say is uh, quelque chose. Um, but uh, in Quebec, they'll, they'll say quelque chose. Cake, cake shows. Uh huh. Like they, it's, it's strange. It's, I don't, whatever it is about this word, something. I guess it means it, but it definitely becomes a tribal. Oh, it, well, I say something. Like, how well, weird is that to other people that aren't from BC? For the word something, I say something. There's a similar thing in the American in South, in Louisiana, where you had a strong French group of people that lived there forever. And they, you have the Cajun culture, and you still have people that speak a kind of French, but it would be unrecognizable to a Frenchman, you know? Yeah, well. But all of these things, I, I remember listening for years and years to a guy, a Creole, I think I, was the thing I was trying to say about the, the Louisianans, but I remember that Alan, like, he listened to all kinds of different people and things, and it just was always, there was always something we were listening to or learning from. And Michael Savage was a guy that had a late night show for many, many years, and his whole thing, he was supposedly kind of conservative, but his whole philosophy was uh, borders, language, culture, something like that. He said summed up his whole philosophy. So I, I think what's happened is that the nation state has been so eroded and hammered on for years and years and years, and then we've had emigration from all other kinds of cultures that in a sense we have broken down into tribal systems within each country. Because if you think about it, what defines, uh, it, let's just say that Savage has got something with his philosophy. Then you've got a border, but what we're seeing almost universally is because of one reason or another, our borders aren't, they're, they're pretty permeable. Then you've got language, and some of that language people do themselves to give them their own lingo, you know. In other words, they're trying to say, well, we don't speak English, we speak this certain, and and that that language might, if you listen, like language will identify you if you are keeping up with the mainstream news and the way that people talk nowadays, and I, I can't really keep up, but you will hear things like, well, let me unpack that for you. I just want to drill down. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? These little things. And that identifies yeah. you as somebody, oh, you're a faithful watcher of CNN. or You know what I'm saying? The, the, the talking yeah. head has spoken and they've said, we're going to unpack this. So that's a way in which language becomes, you, you know, makes your own little ghetto or your own little tribe for you because you just intuitively or instinctively know that if you're going to be cool and you're going to be in the end group, that you'll have to say whatever the thing is at that time. So it might be that you've got to be proactive. You see, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So what, well, this guy's name was Savage because Desmond Morris wrote about this in the '60s. He called it subtribes. Ah. And so you'll they'll develop their own tribal identification, like say the surfers, mm-hmm. a snarly man, or whatever they say. They got mm-hmm. their whole language on their own. Mm-hmm. And they grew up in homes where, and the, like the main tribe, like a nation, he calls a super tribe. And so, yeah, and the sub tribes will make their own identifications for sure. And like you said, um, if you're listening to CNN, you're, you're going to start repeating what the CNN anchor said in his terminology. Mm-hmm. And it's 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 very insidious now. At the at the top, and how we're organized, these ways of being the memes the whatever the cool terminology is that is all seeded from the top and then it's picked up on and and so whatever group that you go into or gravitate towards 
you will hear if whether it's in politics and you identify left or right on the politics you'll have your own language and those are the kind of cool things that everybody just seems to know yeah yeah just like ask they don't have to ask where are you from so i can prejudge you you tell them in it, your identifications when it, you speak exactly <laughs> I am curious, we'll, we'll move from tribes into you've started to question things at such a young age, you discover Alan. Now, you were doing an, an, an interesting kind of work that put you in the belly of the beast for a while. And I wonder... Yeah, well, that's what I started doing. I used to travel a lot and kind of got bored with it. Like the last time I was in Nepal, those the kids were more up on the MTV fashions than they were back in Canada. Then I just started get because I was one adventure, that's what I call it, or, or just something cool, a learning experience. So I started taking jobs. And that when, when COVID started, I t- took a job in patient transport at the hospital. And that's fascinating. Like I joke around that I'm working at a cult now, a Buddhist cult, and I'll, uh, that's a whole nother adventure. <laughs> but at the hospital, I would transport patients from all these different departments and then we might be an hour on the road and, I, and the patient wants to talk about the doctor, you know, what happened and they, they were telling me everything. That was a really interesting adventure. Still thinking about going back. And You know, Johnny and I have been talking about get adaptation via technology and how it appeared to me that it's it's pretty much real time. And Darren had uh, piped in on a little audio recording later and said he thought it was more elemental than that, that it was at, that it's actually biochemical. And Yeah, because it, it's almost like a Wi-Fi connection now that we have Wi-Fi. I think the left hemisphere does scan things and, and you can even start to feel other people's emotions and like when I went to the hospital to, to get a COVID positive patient, the nurses were scared. A lot of them freaked out. And so I would go in like just superhero, like step aside, nurses, Batman is here. <laughs> you know, I'll risk my life to, to take this man home. And, and I, but I, but as I was, as they were dressing me up in my hazmat suit, I, I would start to feel fear and the heebie jeebies and, and like, whoa, maybe I don't want to go near this guy. It was catching from them. There's definitely, we're totally, we are definitely connected in that way. Mm-hmm. And that was, boy, my last crazy mushroom trip. I took too many by accident and I, it was bad for hours. I could just hear all these intrusive voices. And I was thinking AI is deep in my head here, but it could just be repeat. Like, I don't know what goes on. I should have stayed away from the mushrooms, just freaked out and got bored one day. But it, 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 that's the way I remember it. Like I'm hearing constant repetition in my head and I just wanted it to stop. But, I mean, that's not really a scientific experiment. I could have just went crazy for a few hours. But that's what I remember thinking. Boy, they're deep inside. I can hear everything. Constant message. Like like that movie, They Live. Sleep, sleep, sleep. A way to try to make it a real experiment is to see what happens if you immerse yourself in that situation without the mushrooms. Uh, well, no, I was just on the beach and I was hearing ah. like, <laughs> I barely made my way to the beach. And, uh, but that's a whole nother story. I shouldn't go off track. Definitely. I think there's a connection that you can feel other people's emotions, probably what they're thinking. And yeah, I'm kind of jumping in here cause that would go back to the right and left, uh, brain, but I'm um, jumping topics way too quick here. I was thinking, well, yeah, I felt what the nurses felt, but uh, that's right hemisphere. And I think that is atrophied in most people. So you're not using it. it but see, I can't just dive into this without trying to explain books I've been reading that are, that are, they begin to discover that, well, you have a right and left hemisphere for your brain, and they're two separate computers doing two completely different functions. I remember, and I actually jotted this down when we were talking a couple of months ago, and I have opened it up to my notebook to this page. You had been reading something by Ian McGilchrist. I I didn't write down the name of the book, but you you basically summed it up. You had spoken for quite a while on the right 
and left hemisphere. But for me, you made it as simple as you possibly could by saying the right hemisphere is serotonin fueled and the left hemisphere is dopamine fueled. Yeah, they kind of reward with those two chemicals. According to Ian McGilchrist, he's put together a lot of research from way back. I have a, So his book is called The Master and His Emissary, uh, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. Because we really see, and it's a lot of uh, studies on people that have had strokes, so that one side, one hemisphere is not working. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and vice versa. And then they were experimenting on people by, by putting anesthesia in a, a carteroid vein and kind of putting one hemisphere to sleep and then put that person through a series of tests. Mm-hmm. And then the same person and, and it's two opposite, uh, answers. Um, the best way I can try and sum it up is that the lowest common denominator is animals that, uh, have eyes on either side of their head. So by studying them, he noticed that the right hemisphere, which is the left eye, was looking for danger. Because in this world, like, we eat or we be eaten, everything's devouring everything else just to survive. So the two main components was the animal had to look for food and also look for uh, predators so he doesn't become food or she... So they had two eyes, and like you see, like with birds, chipmunks, like dogs and cats look straight ahead like humans. And then they, they experimented on fighting fish, because the fighting fish were always watching each other with their left eye, which would have been food. But see, because it gets complicated, there's also ego and other things in there. Then they gave the fighting fish serotonin reuptake inhibitor, like Prozac and all its different chemical names now. So that's a, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So it literally plugs up the holes where your body would reuptake the serotonin that's released. It kind of keeps you on a serotonin high all day. I don't know. I've never tried Prozac or. And anyways, the fighting fish, when it was given serotonin reuptake inhibitor, would look at the other fish with the other eye, with the mm. right hemisphere, and wouldn't be so aggressive and wouldn't want to fight. And when I was reading this, I thought, well, that gives a whole new definition to turn the other cheek. Doesn't mean like get punched in the side of the head and let him punch you on the other side of the head. Turn the other cheek could be translated into something completely different. Like, why don't you study your opponent with the other hemisphere or both hemispheres. Yeah, or, or just see something from a different perspective. So the, the left hemisphere uh, is like ego and stuff. So you, we're used to dopamine. We have no problem with dopamine. Uh, it doesn't even feel like a drug. You get promotion at work or you buy a brand new truck. Then you, you just feel really good. Oh, boy, I'm going to call all my friends, tell them like you're just on a high. That's mm-hmm. dopamine. But we didn't really see it as a drug. You just feel really good. But serotonin, since we're not used to it, and the right hemisphere is so, uh, it's blocked. So we're, we're not used to using it. So the serotonin, when it is released, can be a high. Like I remember after doing these, these meditations and, uh, oh man, it's so hard to explain all this. It's so easy to have all this in your head, then sit down and try and explain it. Um, no, oh, you're doing fine, Peter. Okay. I'll just keep plowing through then. So with this one, you're exercising an atrophied right hemisphere. So the stroke victims that had their uh, right hemisphere, you know, defaulted through the stroke, they would do really weird things like they they could only think that they had half a body. Like when they would try and shave, they'd only shave the left side of their face. 
and they would not admit that they had a left side. The doctor saying, whose hand is this? It's not mine. Like shadow projection, all those things come mm-hmm. from the left. It will not admit that anything's wrong, everything's perfect, and it just sees whatever it wants to see. And it gets real grumpy when you try and point out things that are uh, out of its uh, peripheral view on the on the other side. It, it gets super – just like when you're trying to explain – Something people say, but they get annoyed. That's a conspiracy theory. I don't need to hear that. It's cognitive dissidence. That's the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. But the right hemisphere feels on both sides of of the body, but they can't talk. So they can still walk around. They're not paralyzed, but they have trouble talking because the left hemisphere has suffered the stroke. When you talk about the right hemisphere not, not being used or being atrophied, or what do you mean? That, that. It's in between the two, they communicate almost like a switchboard. There's other neuro, uh, there's other fibers and connections up in the frontal lobe and other places, but the main switchboard is called the corpus callosum, and that's right in between the two hemispheres. And its main function is to block. I almost think of it like the old switchboard in the movies. But the guy would run up to the payphone, spin it around and say, operator, get me to the police. And then she would be there and she would unplug him from there and plug him into like she was like a switchboard directory. And so the corpus callosum blocks mostly from one hemisphere to the other. Um, and it doesn't allow communication between them. And so it, the corpus callosum means um, in Latin callous body. Why they called this center of the brain a callous body, I thought was strange at first. But so now that's what this meditation does. You, you're feeling around on the inside of your body. So this can only be done with the right hemisphere. You can't even, and there's so many nerves on the inside. You can begin to feel your heart beating. You can feel when you get an emotions. You feel the chemical, biochemical response. You feel it as a real, tangible feeling. And this can only be done by the right hemisphere. So that's what they're doing when they sat there. They're they're slowly building up the neurons, opening up the communications, and letting the right hemisphere feel around. It's almost like learning how to walk again after being your legs atrophied in a wheelchair. And right away it starts releasing serotonin and you get really high on serotonin. It used to come up all the time when I was reading. I was in an emergency medical responder course and, and, I, and just from reading and listening to the new information coming in, oh, I got a huge serotonin rush. I was just thinking, oh, I hope the teacher doesn't call on me. She's going to think I'm stoned. It's not easy to, because we're just not used to it. We don't know how to ride it. Well, what I'm curious well, me, about, me. what I am curious about is, based on your own thinking about this and your research, you're talking about it being underused or underutilized. People don't know how to bridge the two. I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but is there something in our modern life and our culture? Because obviously the right hemisphere is very important. Well, yes, Alan used to explain this in lots of different ways. Yes. The right hemisphere is atrophied, it's shut down by our culture and by our parents. Like he said, the kids would just, they would both have the same song playing in their head. It was basically telepathy. Mm-hmm. And then they get yelled at by the parents, don't be so silly, you know, that's not, and you literally learn to shut it down. And so, so this th- this meditation technique is, it's like, It's Buddhist, but if you really look back, Buddhism seems to be founded by Ashoka the Cruel, what the Masons call Ashoka the Great. So this guy, a total psychopath, like classic ruler, despot ruler, like killed all his siblings except for one who uh, became a priest, a monk, and forsake his right to the throne and everything else, probably just to save his own life. Uh, It was... This Ashoka is the one that founded Buddhism. So he conquered most of India through military conquest and, you know, all the murder and stuff that comes with war and uh, took a part of Afghanistan, I believe. He had a huge empire. People can look it up. I can't put the date down because there's different versions, like as if they don't really know exactly when. 
And he chose this Buddhism thing to be his new religion, to bind all of the other countries that he that he uh, conquered, all of the little empires throughout India that he conquered in Afghanistan. So at first, there, if there was a, a Buddha or a Siddhartha a Gautama, he was still royalty too. And so they seem to have high, high sciences and in mind control, like mm-hmm. they just whip up a religion and create it and then, you know, give it to all these conquered people. And they had to design it that could catch on fast, that like serotonin rush and the meditation. And those people were way different back then, too. In India, like 2,300 years ago, Carl Jung said that Westerners shouldn't even bother with these techniques because we're completely different people with different cultures. It's like taking somebody else's medicine that's not meant for you. Well, that's what Alan Watts, the... Not your Alan, but the Alan Watts from the 60s and 70s. That's what he said. Um, so, yeah, where am I going here? Yeah, okay, Carry on with Ashika. He had high sciences, and he understood psychological warfare. And he put out all these different rumors and stuff. There's still myths you can read about online about his palace of torture. It was called the Buddhist Hells. And he would torture people to death, and they could. They had molten metals back then, and he would pour it on people. But he probably just released all these rumors to put shock and fear into the peoples he was conquering. Then, with this new uh, Buddhism, uh, he sent out missionaries to other countries surrounding him that he probably wanted to conquer to soften them up. And like, like he was at that point, he was using psychological warfare to conquer other nations like Sri Lanka and Buddhism still heavy in there. Mm -hmm. And they say Pali is the the language that Buddha spoke, but I think that was the language Ashoka spoke. And Buddha was supposed to be a few hundred years before. And it's really interesting because they brought back the karma and the reincarnation. Now, that was a Hindu thing to keep people in line and psychological mind control to keep them slaves. So if you were born, like, you know, the caste system, you got the untouchables. I don't know the names of the rest of them, but they go up in rank. So if you were born on the bottom, that was your own Well, the Brahmin would be at the, the Brahmin are at the top. That's your ruling elite. And the Brahmin, no matter how savage, no matter how horrible, how they work slaves to death, they were in their position because they were good people. Mm -hmm. They had good karma. Mm -hmm. So it's okay for them to murder or do whatever they do. And the slaves on the bottom that lived on hardly any food and had to watch their children die disease and work themselves to death was their own fault well that was Mm -hmm. your bad karma your bad person so that was the scam back then and so this guy Saharta kind of wanted a possibility he was freeing people from that system I think it was just to degrade the old Hindu system and then bring up a new system with this Buddhism that was all over India like first they had to dissolve or dismantle the old belief system. So they, this guy, Siddhartha, would travel all around and teach people Buddhism, and he wanted to free them from their belief systems in karma and the, and the wheel of reincarnation, because it was just a scam. But then Ashoka, the cruel, he brought it all back again. So the people that, that meditate here, they hear about the religion, and they believe in karma, and they believe in good deeds, and... They believe in all of that stuff, but it's their religion. So, yeah, there's an earful for you. It probably doesn't mean anything to people. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're living in the middle of this adventure like me. Peter, you know, you talked about Alan talking about this. Well, you know, not in super great detail, a little bit here and a little bit there. But what he what he was often talking about was intuition or how we get yeah. information. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to the right hemisphere because I just wonder if you have given thought to, in our modern Western culture, how has the right hemisphere been submerged? How how do they atrophy it? How how do they atrophy it? I mean, because I was having a conversation on real history with Book of Hours couple, Julie and JP, and we were talking, they're both artists, and they said that, a lot of their process is intuitive that they just they they intuit what ideas about where to go next and e- even in communicating with each other 
So a lot of the information that they bring in to their brain, into their orbit, comes from what you'd call in, intuition. It's a more creative no. process. And they were saying, when I spoke to them on one uh, episode, is that in the so-called scientific community, even in the psychological community, even in the artistic community, it's just not talked about intuition. It's because we're in such a materialistic culture. Yeah, well, we're domesticated. So like I was saying, the animals that have their eyes on both sides of their head, the right hemisphere is a survival instinct. Like Alan repeated so many times. So how do you atrophy the right hemisphere? You yeah. domesticate the culture or the animal so it has no survival instincts. It, the right hemisphere just shuts down and doesn't really search for danger. It's like, like living in socialism. You think the world revolves around you like a little baby. That's how you atrophy it. And then there's other things, like you said, like telling, like telling people intuition's silly. You shut the kids down right away. They learn mm-hmm. from their parents. They learn the culture. And they learn uh, that, no, you, you don't have a survival instinct that scans the horizon. Like I was saying that one time, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I thought somebody's at my car from a dead sleep. And I went out and I looked out the window and my interior light was on. That means they tried to handle. So I opened the window to yell out at him, like, get the fuck out of there. And all that came out of my mouth was, because I'm like, whoa. And I couldn't, and I just went back to bed because I seen they were gone. But then I thought after that's right hemisphere. Like I, it knew someone was out at my car. There was no noise that I heard. I just knew I went out there. Lots of times that's happened, like, I just wake up from a dead sleep like my ex-girlfriend's son. I was on night shift and he's crawling across my bedroom floor to try and sneak sneak a cigarette out of my pack. (laughs) I just wake up from a dead sleep and stare right at him and scare him. He just turned around and crawled right back out and went back to sleep. I didn't even remember that, but your right hemisphere is a survival uh, mechanism and it's capable of a lot more than what we think is possible. All these things they call ESP and... It's just, it's really not that great of a thing. Uh, it, I guess it is when you're in a cult. Like in India, there's so many villages I'd pass through where the people would seem to be just telepathic. Like, so you, you'd have to experience it for yourself. And especially the sadhus, that's when you could ask them a question in your head and they'd answer you out loud. I ran into that on my friend's uh, reserve too. I don't want to name the reserve, but their uncle was just incredible. I just asked him, like, do you talk this way in my head? Do you talk this way with my friend's dad? And he said, and then he just answered me out loud, like, yeah, we, we click one time when we were painting. Mm-hmm. So for those other, I, and then I questioned a teacher I had, uh, an East Indian teacher. Well, it's probably Punjabi. Most Canadians are Punjabi. And I brought that up. It was in a psychological class, and I brought up, well, like half the people in India are crazy because they believe they can speak telepathy. And he didn't deny it. He just started defending them. Well, that's just part of their culture and their religion. And But he knew, too. And he was totally Canadian, grew up here. Mm-hmm. So there's other cultures that use their right hemisphere. And we just think that's crap. Like, that's not true. That's there's probably one, a part of it. There's one thing that Alan told me, and... That was that because you see, we are in a culture where it has been atrophied. So if you can do it, you know, Alan said, well, yes, but it, it's not polite. I I don't think polite was the word that he used. In other words, can you get into somebody's head? Yeah, sure. All the time. I mean, could he get into mine? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) But, But it's not. If you've got a talent, but the people around you have that talent atrophied, then just to go inside on a one-way, that, that's like a fishing trip then. You see what I'm saying? It's not communication. It's a nightmare. Because I'm feeling people's emotions, and a lot of people are miserable or mm-hmm. angry or don't even like it, even though they're smiling. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, I think that that's part of the disconnect. You know, I think Alan was very self-contained and he was pretty comfortable with being different. And, you know, so he wasn't surrounded by people that 
could communicate. Yeah, I noticed. Uh, moved way, way, way out in the bush. Yeah. But I think um, I know why. Yeah, because it's a it's a burden to be able to do that <laughs> when nobody around it, when I, it's when it isn't reciprocal. You see what I'm saying? In other words, like oh. you're talking about, I, I like that way of thinking about it, Peter. That that it's a wild brain, right? Because even somebody yeah. like Charles Galton Darwin, I mean, they knew what they knew what they were doing in domesticating us. They knew that oh, their yeah. class of people had to retain their wildness. So if somebody slips through the wire or under the fence, so to speak, and you've got somebody, like in the movie you were talking about, they live, so you've got somebody who has the ability to process information using a different part of their brain, and they live in a culture in which people do that very little, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard on wild people who aren't part of the elite ruling class. Yeah, that's true. I can only imagine what they're up to or how they communicate or what they can do. They definitely knew about this, and they knew about it long before they started. Like I'm saying, Buddhism, the meditation technique of Buddhism is at least 2,300 years old, and it was meant for mind control. And they, the right hemisphere, because they've been playing with serotonin for a long time. I guess MDMA, well, you know, I looked this up on Google, so who knows. But uh, MDMA that releases uh, serotonin, it's different than serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's like a diarrhea, like boom, all your serotonin comes out at once. Like I remember you could, you could like logger lads, uh, logger lads, like in England. When I was there, everybody would say, like, when they're drinking in the pub, they start arguing, they could fight. When they go to the dance floor and they're all taking ecstasy, they're hugging and crying each other. Mm -hmm. but they're, they're hugging, they're crying and hugging each other, I mean to say. A great philosopher once wrote, Naughty, naughty, very naughty. <laughs> And he goes by the name of Ebenezer Good His friends call him Ezer and he is the main geezer And he vibe by the place like no other man could He's refined, he's sublime, he makes you feel fine And very much maligned and misunderstood But if you know Ezer, he's a real crowd pleaser He's ever so good, he's Ebenezer Good You see that he's mischievous, mysterious and devious When he circulates amongst the people in the place Once you know he's fun, and something of a genius He gives a grin that goes around face to face to face Backwards and then forwards, forwards and then backwards Ezer is a geezer, he loves to muscle in That's about the time the crowd has shout the name of Ezer And he's punched in the corner laughing by the base bin And that was that's the serotonin rush that mm -hmm. we're not getting from our right hemisphere. So this German company named Merrick, I think, and that's another thing for everybody out there. I always get names and dates wrong. It's all just a, 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 a intuition in my head. I never really. It's the left hemisphere that uh, categorizes everything by date and time, and like it has its own purpose too. Okay, I'm getting way off. So this this company Merrick, they first patented MDMA according to Google, in like 1912. Mm -hmm. And they founded their corporation in the 1600s. So this pharmaceutical company, when they started out, they were literally alchemists, I did think, by the 1600s. And they, but it, they never started to use uh, MDMA, that's ecstasy, molly. Uh, they never started using it in therapy until the 70s. And that's the same time that they started to use the serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they knew what they wanted. They knew that the right hemisphere isn't releasing serotonin and it's because uh, it's atrophied and it's causing people. So they were experimenting with how do we release serotonin. They still are to this day. 
but uh, but uh, yeah. obviously they obviously they want to re- they want to control how it's released <laughs> you know yeah they have to be in control yeah, oh, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right <laughs> but for brain chips and stuff it really should be so much easier just to tap into the right hemispheres whatever it's communicating in in wavelengths and you don't need to stick a brain chip in somebody unless you want to like torture them and or chemically control them I've been the one to party until the end looking for the after party to begin I'm going down to la 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 But still, it's all just a hunch. Like, like I said, I, I still, I, I don't have my grade ten because <laughs> I, I don't have my grade ten French, even though I speak French. Like, don't look to me for answers. This is just my wild <laughs> guess, or maybe that's because I'm wild. <laughs> well, okay. So you you had your fill of patient transport during the COVID era. So then what you did was took a little bit of time off. Yeah, I got drunk for all winter, and then I thought I'd better get a new adventure. Well, I just have to say, is it okay for me to share how I know that uh, Peter's drunk? Yeah, give her. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because I'm going to have an inbox full of song clips and movie clips and, you know, just one after another. I was like, okay, well, there's Peter. Peter got the bottle out, and and I've got great music. If I have time to listen to it, there's a, oh, there's another song from Peter. <laughs> well, that's very nice of you to say, because I'm so embarrassed every time I wake up, and I can't stop myself. Don't say you're doing fine. Don't hide yourself away. There's something on your mind. My drunken mind just figures she's going to love this one. She's going to love the last 18. It's what a terrible habit. I used to send messages to my bosses. Like, your son-in-law, the superintendent, he's a fucking idiot. You know that, eh? Oh, Peter. <laughs> just, uh, I, the phone Peter. is the worst thing for me. It just I'll have a drunken thought, and it runs right down my fingers into the phone, and there it goes. Chink. Well, I kind of gave up. I spent a long time, you know, e- emailing and going, well... Peter, so, sobriety is a good thing, and you know here's why you shouldn't drink. And you know, so like finally, I'm like, okay. I know that well, was really kind of you. Big messages, and I knew it, but uh, well, I'm doing a lot better. Like one bottle of vodka a month, that's not bad. That's awesome for a wino like me. Is that good? Are you have you improved? That's great. I have to tell you though. I mean, I'm just gonna say this. I you know I know it, it, life is hard blah, 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 but there is nothing in the world that beats a clear, sober mind. All oh, the, I know. All like, the I way, know. all the way dried up and cleaned out and 
functioning on it, you know, because then, then what happens is that everything that you know, everything that is a part of you, it all just comes together. It coalesces, so to speak, because your the biochemistry of your body is not fighting those attacks that you put it under. And really, that's yeah. what alcohol is. It's like, you know, an attack. But anyway, that's... That's my well, lecture. Well, no, that's what I'm learning here because I barely, well, smoke a little bit of weed sometimes and drink. And then uh, since I'm really here, I'm still meditating and feeling all around. You get really sensitive and uh, you can feel it terrible. But still, sometimes I just want to get take a break from the cult or the adventure. All right. Well, we're going to w- w- wind down the conversation, but I do want you yeah. to, I, would, I want you to share just a little bit about what prompted you. You've described where you are as a cult. And, oh, well, the but, reason I, because um, just that I figured that's what people are going to think. So I, let's just throw that up there right now. Do and you, have can, a, can like, you, yeah, I'm working at a Buddhist cult. But can you share, up, Peter, okay? can you share the type? I, I don't want to say anything that you don't want to talk about, but can you share the type of meditation that you... Buddhist Vipassana. It's Vipassana meditation. It's really simple. You could explain it really quickly. Like I already did. You, you learn to feel around inside. So you feel, you can, you're feeling on the inside of your body, which none of us do. That's why they call it the callous body. Mm-hmm. When you stifle the right hemisphere, and you're because you don't feel what's going on in your body. Once you start to grow enough neurons or whatever happens, and you you're 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 using your right hemisphere, you can feel emotions. You can feel a lot of things that you never felt before. You can feel the biochemical responses in your body. You can feel them really strongly. Now, a while um, back, you and I were talking, and you talked about actual intelligence agency involvement in this. Did you want to? Oh, yeah. Well, the, I mean, CIA and KGB were well interested in all of these techniques. Like Yuri Bezhinov, that KGB guy. See, the one that the Beatles went to, that one is just, it seems to be concentrating on one thing, which is hypnotism. So they're not feeling around in their body or any of that. Were the Beatles, I, I, I think one of the Beatles was at least TM, but was, was that Transcendental Meditation? Was that their thing? I don't think it was. They had a guru. Alan used to talk about it. Yeah, I, rem- I can't remember their name, but... Sexy Sadie. Oh, now, the, the, Beatle, the, the Beatles were Transcendental Meditation. Okay. Yeah. I don't, because I don't know what Transcendental that was Meditation the, is. That was the Maharishi uh, Mahesh Yogi. Okay, yeah. Yuri yeah. Bezhinov. You remember him, right? Yes, the yes. The KGB guy uh-huh. that defected to Canada? Uh-huh. Yeah, he was sent there, and he just couldn't believe, like, what idiots people were to believe in all this stuff, and they're going to fix the world just by navel-gazing. Techniques. See, the, the transcendental meditation, that what, one of the things that they're famous for is this levitation or the, you know, the, the kind of flying thing. But this has been exposed. Um, in other words, you do this meditation and you can actually lift off the ground, but you can't really do it, you know. I mean, well, it's... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people, the filmmaker David Lynch has been a big proponent of transcendental meditation. Goldie Hawn, the actress. Now, the the the, the, the bad thing about this is that... Because of people like David Lynch and Goldie Hawn, they have been able to get whole, you know, major school districts involved in promoting a type of transcendental meditation for school children. And they talk about it's great for mental health and so so forth and so on. But it's just basically, you know, the cult of transcendental meditation. Yeah, I can't speak for their technique. All I just, I just thought, what were the Beatles up to? So I watched it on YouTube, mm-hmm. and then listened to Yuri Bezhinov, and he he describes it because he went there to learn it, and uh, they focus on one thing—a mantra or a candle or an object. So that's the same as waving a watch in front of someone, saying, mm-hmm. "Look at the watch. You're getting mm-hmm. very sleepy." That's mm-hmm. like that's an obvious way to hypnotize people. So they were useful idiots thinking they could change the world with good vibrations. That's what happens here. You come and learn this meditation technique. 
most of the students are like 70% are new. It's their first time and they never come back. So you could look at that demographic and say the ones that stay, well, 20% are highly suggestible. But there's also other ones that go, wow, this is amazing. I'm full of serotonin. My like the ones that have a chance at waking up their right hemisphere. So they they don't listen to any of the religious stuff. They just come here because it's a good place to and like biochemical, like you're saying, you're all in it together when you're all in the meditation hall together. Everybody's doing the same thing. So it's a good place to exercise and uh, they come back. But the ones that buy the religion, it's it's perfect for Klaus Schwab. Own nothing and be happy. Like, don't mouth off. Like if you've got a mean boss or bad situation. Well, that's your own karma. And best way is just through love and metta, they call it. Uh, like just just like the one the Beatles went to, you can you can fix the world through love. They're driving me crazy. The girl upstairs, she keeps going for hikes out. There's tons of bears because there's a drought. They play with the weather so much. There's a bad drought this year, and the bears are coming in. They even bit into a jerry can mm. of uh, diesel, thinking it was mm. food. Or they're looking for food everywhere. But she's marching out there. She's got her bear spray and bear bangers. They're like fireworks you can shoot off. But I'm just like, um, can you please? I almost said her name. Um, just she's driving me nuts, even though I go for walks, too, but feels like I'm OK with my bear spray and bear bangers. But, yeah, so I wonder, I hope she's not marching out there thinking that she's just going to give the bear loving Meta and he's going to walk away because you're going to start getting hungry this next month, especially. So it is like it's it's crazy because it's two things. It, it's waking up the right hemisphere, which is your survival instinct. But at the same time, it's capping down hard to domesticate you with the religion. Mm -hmm. So there's a sm there's all kinds of people that come through here, really cool people. That they're coming here for the cheese and the mouse trap. Mm -hmm. They want to meditate and work their right hemisphere, but they're not buying any of the crap that's been like be a good slave that Ashoka the Cruel created with his count. Like he took over so many different empires he must have captured all kinds of intelligence and priests and advisors, kind of like Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. He would have had an army of, of people with old archives and, and how religions work. And, and, and they literally created a new religion called Buddhism. But the reason I call it a cult also is like the town I grew up in, they, the greeting, like, the most important thing is that you're keeping busy. You got a job, you're working overtime, you got a big home, a big truck. You got to always be busy. So instead of saying, how's it going or how are you? The greeting is keep them busy. That's what they say. <laughs> we meet a guy at the Walmart. Oh, yeah, so are you keeping busy? <laughs> so I always had to have, and I would always have some crazy adventure. So I just love to tell them, keep them busy. Yeah, I'm transporting COVID positive patients. What? I'd love to always shock them. So especially now, if I go there and they say, are you keep them busy? Yeah, I'm working at a Buddhist cult. That one really just <laughs> floors them. They change the subject right away. They don't even want to go there. They knew there was gonna, I was up to something crazy all the time. But so this is why I just like to throw it up there. Am I in a cult? Because I don't mind talking about it. You don't have to be polite. Like if I just tell them I'm at a meditation center. Like the first thing they think is cult. Oh, he's, he's, he's in a cult. It's mm -hmm. so like I just throw it up there and let's talk about it. But it's more of a, a church scene that I like. Like they had a children's course and the kids like they they did 10 minutes of meditation where they just that just concentrate on what you feel your breath coming in. And uh, it was just like Alan said about school kids. The girls could sit there still for like five minutes almost. They only do 10 minutes at a time. The boys couldn't. They were moving right away, like from as soon as they sat down, punching the other kid in the arm, and they just couldn't do it. They were there to, to play all the games like badminton and football and all the stuff they were playing. And it was like a church scene, and the parents came and stayed with them. It was only for a couple of days. And uh, I just remember thinking this is, because I never had that, never mm -hmm. had the church picnic, and everybody thinks or believes that they're doing the right thing, and and we're all good people. Like, that's a cool feeling. I don't mind working here for that. But And the people come and the people go. What you're talking about, even when you're talking about the people that come there just to learn the technology, but they're not interested in the church vibe, they're going to take it and, you know, do something with it. Well, those would be the ones to watch. That's an interesting uh, classification of human right there. 
But I do think, you know, Alan used to describe going to church and getting the, I don't remember the word that he used, but let's just call it the love vibe, or they're going to, you know, love you to death. You you see what I'm saying? They're they're going to Uh enclose you. It's It's an actual technique where people want to bring you in. It's just church people do this, right? So they give you this yeah. embrace. And then when it gets oh, more, God. yeah, and when it gets more into the churchy thing, the proselytizing or the sharing the word, then you're going to get more and more of that because he, that that's they're bearing witness. They're bearing witness to their lifestyle. Oh, you know, see what the Bible can do for you. See what Jesus can do for you. And so what you're doing is you're getting people on a high. You're transporting them on that high. And the, I, I, I don't know if sinister is the right word, but the, the downside of this is that you've taken huge reservoir of energy that a person has, whether it's a Buddhist cult or a Christian or whatever you want to, a meditation center, it is all the same thing. They're tapping into the energy of the right hemisphere and then that energy is being funneled into whatever it is that the group is deciding that they're doing, or someone at the top is deciding the group is doing for them. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Like when you said that about the Christians, I remember, I think they were Pentecostal. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I was I was drinking at a fountain in downtown Langley, and this, this guy pulls up his truck and said, I just had a strong feeling that you should come to church with me. He said, well, can I bring my beer? And he said, yeah, let's go. And I said, okay, here's an adventure. This is going to be great. So we got to the church. Somebody smuggled the beer in behind the toilet. And then I went, and they were there was a, a band playing, and there was dancing. And everybody, you know how they hold their hands up, and they feel the the biochemistry of the group, like we're all one. We're the group, like, yeah, I feel Jesus. I was like, that's oh, an adventure I've and never that, had, Peter. I've never been in a Pentecostal huh? I said, you you went I on an adventure I've never had. I had <laughs> uh, well, I might have it wrong. Whatever they were, that's what they were. And then I, uh, and I went up and started dancing, and then two bouncers came and grabbed me on either shoulder and marched me out. And they said, sometimes newcomers might have alcohol in their system, and they feel the power of the Lord. And it's too much for him. So then I was in the hallway and I'm thinking about how to get my beer and get out of here. And they literally surrounded me with my back against the wall. And they all started, I think it's called testimonials. Uh, uh And then they walked up and I thought I was doing the right thing, cocaine and whiskey. And then I found the power of the Lord. And then like I was like, like, holy cow, how do I get out of here? Just shove one guy over and run for it. Oh, that um, was, that, I, that, that is the, that's, you know, Alan would say it's love bombing. Yeah. That was it. You, they, the yep, you get you. love bombed. You go into, and whatever, uh, you know, it's not just churches. It's not just Christian churches or Buddhist meditation centers. But when you're, when somebody wants you, and particularly when they want to use your energy for their cause, you get love bombed. Yeah. So here... You come, and once it starts, you don't talk or make eye contact with anybody. This is your thing on your own. And the only person you talk to is, like, there's a manager that you can ask if you have problems. So you're not talking to anybody. And you listen to an hour-long discourse from this guy from Burma, but he's he's a Hindu from India or whatever. He was born there. And he, he tells his stories in the old religion and stuff. And they can work people up and there might be some love bombing in there, but that's all it is. Most of the time you're meditating in pain and bored out of your mind and learning how to do it. And uh, you don't talk to anyone. Then on the 10th day, you start talking to everybody. It's mostly the students talking to each other. The love bombing part, yeah, it's still there. Like people come back and then they, they, they volunteer, they work in the kitchen for free. And there's still that churchy atmosphere, but... Like after those Pentecostals, there's nothing like that. Like nobody <laughs> tells you. You just listen to this recording made in the early 90s that he gave when he did a meditation course in England. And like I said, most of the, the students are new, like 70%. They uh-huh. just come one time. You'll never see them again. So how came, long have you been there now? How long have I been here? Mm-hmm. Uh, a manager, I saw. I took the job in May. Mm. 
And like I said, it's like to go back. My boss wants me to go back to patient transport. I looked up the price of real estate or real estate of rent. And mm-hmm. the cabin that I used to rent when I worked there for a thousand bucks is now two grand. Mm. Like the, the rent went up doubled in the past. Like it's only been two and a half years since I was there. And the price of food is almost doubled. So it, for me to move back there, it could cost three or four thousand bucks just for my rent and my food, just like Alan told us was going to happen. Peter, I, we are going to wrap it, I think. Okay, right on. I want to get but down to the river. Are you going to get your suntanning in? We're going to have to check in again on an official recording when you, when we're in the thick of act two and see if you have decided i almost feel like it's an installment of a great series here you know did peter stay did peter stay at the meditation (laughs) or did he go back to transporting patients um yeah okay right on just got started this is great Nervous at first, but uh, no, it's a lot of fun. No, I'm glad you warmed up. Well, you you know, I I said it um, in the talk that went up with Neil, and I said you were coming on, and I said you're a character in the best sense of the word, and you are because you, what what always strikes me when you uh, email when we've communicated is you really do have a un- you you're unique. You put things across in your style. It's all off the top of your head. Uh, you, you bounce. We can bounce from one thing to another, and it's it's good. Yeah, that's you're, you're the headed towards. You could give me. You're headed towards being a wild man. Yeah, savage. That's yeah. what I always thought. That's a cool character, the savage from Brave New World. Wasn't he cool? You know, I mean, it's a good thing that you think he's cool because this is definitely where we're headed between technology and 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 compliance and conformity. You are either going to be part of the group and conforming at all times, like, you know, in the, the, the biochemical, we all just intuitively know this is what we're supposed to be doing now. And if you don't do that, if you're an outsider, if you're a savage or a wild man, uh, you will be living on the fringes of the new civilization. Well, well, yeah, but right now I can exist right beside him. Like, that's how I can get a job at a Buddhist cult and not really be affected. I mean, it's, you can be still right up close and see what the group is thinking. That's right. And next time we can talk about some of your savage wild man skills like ice fishing, some some of the things that you've gotten on your uh, journeys through India and Nepal and and that, that equip you to survive on the fringes. That'd All be right. Great. Right well, on. great. Thank you so much. I've I just really enjoyed myself here. So thanks a lot. And for everybody who is listening today, next week I am going to be joined by Laura, and this is going to be an interesting episode. I think Laura is someone who. I don't know how she would describe herself, but she came fully awake during the last three years that we have lived through. And before that, she would probably have said she was just a woman going about her business, doing things that she was told to do. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing a bit of her story with you. And thanks for listening. 